Britain has one of the highest levels of spatial inequality of any developed country. Huge differences exist between regions in the UK and even between neighbourhoods in the same city. Differences in employment, educational opportunities, in health. A recent report described the geographical inequality in Britain as being comparable to that between East and West Germany at the end of the Cold War. So is this spatial inequality a problem? And if it is, how can we address it? The concentration of affluence as well as the concentration of disadvantage is a key issue in Western society these days, primarily because it puts a lie to a principle that I think all of our societies share, and that is the notion of meritocracy, that people have an equal opportunity to succeed in a society if they merely try and give it their best shot. I think that the inequality that we see across geography creates huge barriers for this notion of equal opportunity. It creates situations where the disadvantaged simply don't have the same chance to succeed in life as those who live in a more advantaged niche in the spatial economy. Families are exposed to similarly disadvantaged environments for long periods of time. And so most children who live in a disadvantaged neighborhood right now are from families that have lived in similarly disadvantaged environments for multiple generations, uh, at least two generations. Um, and because the consequences appear to be cumulative, that is, it's not just the child's own neighborhood that matters, it's the neighborhood of that child's parents and grandparents generations earlier that have long-lasting and cross-generational impact. So it really means that children are starting from very different places. Where there's a critical mass, layer on layer of disadvantage, um, poor housing, poor employment prospects, poor education, uh, as a consequence, very often poor health, uh, living in a poor environment, your chances of breaking out of that are minimal compared with someone on a low income but living in an entirely different environment with completely different educational and health outcomes. In addition to places mattering for your own outcomes, the bad outcomes from new policies always land in poor and minority communities. The point is that the playing field is no longer equal and that where you're coming up from, where you're growing up, is clearly giving you certain advantages or disadvantages depending on whether you're able to live in more, more the advantaged or disadvantaged pieces of the geography. So clearly, spatial inequality is a real problem facing UK society. It exacerbates inequalities in life outcomes, it affects education, employment and health, and it reinforces inequality down generations. But if spatial inequality is so deeply embedded in the UK economy and society, what can we do about it? And what can we learn from other countries? But to find solutions, we first need to understand the causes. The research in Norway with my colleague, Teria Wessel, is about how multiple generations can pass on their housing wealth and improve the situation for subsequent generations. We found that there's tremendous differences in the opportunities that current young adults have in Norway based purely on a function of where their grandparents lived and whether they owned a home or rented a home. If you, as a current young adult, were fortunate enough to have a grandparent owning a large house in Oslo in 1960, we found that your chances of being a homeowner today were 10% higher than an otherwise identical young person who had a similar grandparent but who rented in the countryside. Not only were you more likely to be a homeowner, but the house you were able to buy was 29% more expensive. The accident of where your grandparents lived have a huge effect on your wealth and housing opportunities as a young person today. Inequality that starts at the spatial level turns into inequality that gets replicated at the spatial level. We've proven that not just from one generation to another, but across three generations. 
So I assume this process is not unique to Norway. In fact, it is surprising that it's so strong in Norway because Norway is at least on its public statements a very egalitarian society. Plus it also has a wealth tax. So it's really trying very hard to work against inequality, but yet even there, the inequality in how prices appreciate across space is turning in to inequality at the personal level. So currently in Glasgow, one in three children in our class is living in poverty, which is a scandalous statistic for any city in a wealthy country. Research has shown that even when you compare Glasgow with other cities with similar high levels of poverty, Glasgow has much, much higher mortality rates, which previously have been, in a, to a degree, unexplained. So what the research published in the last few years has shown that on top of all the, the high levels of poverty and other important issues around histories of deindustrialization, is that Glasgow has been subject to a whole additional set of poor political decision making which has ultimately had, a, had an impact on the people in the city in relation to a whole number of things including building really poor quality um, housing and also investing a lot less money than elsewhere in those households. Economists in particular think that movement across labour markets is very important as an equilibrating mechanism, right? So as one area loses jobs, people move to where the jobs are and that helps equilibrate the unemployment. Um, and we've been seeing in many countries and very much in the U.S. a big decline in that kind of mobility and people are not moving away from high unemployment areas. So it's clear that there isn't a single cause of spatial inequality, but multiple causes that interact and reinforce each other. And this raises the question of how do we tackle spatial inequality? What are the policies that we need to focus on, not just for specific causes of spatial inequality, but also about how they interact with each other. I'd say if I had one lesson that I would apply at any level of government is to recognize that places are holistic, you need comprehensive development, and the funding and governance structures that we put around them are not. They are siloed and divided. We treat people in areas as if they're homogenous, as if all people in certain types of neighborhoods are the same. And we, we know really that they're not. Because they're not, there's a second tier level of policies where we need to look at individual, more bespoke type of options so that you can address individual needs and you can address individual um, activities and provide bespoke level help so that we can actually get down to the root causes and provide support for people in the ways that they need it and not just in a one-size-fits-all. So I, I would argue for a place and a people-based policy to, to address inequalities. Well, there are a whole bunch of ways that we can reduce spatial inequality and, and they come in different forms. So one way is to give people the opportunity to make moves and really sustainable moves to a different environment with more opportunity. So that means you can't just provide vouchers that, that give people the chance to make a short-term move, you actually have to provide the type of supports that allow people to thrive in their new community. Second uh, approach is, is to provide investments in uh, neighborhoods and, and really entire cities that have le been left behind in the new economy. And then a third approach is, is to just change the way we do housing and land use and uh, policy so that we are not creating and reinforcing uh, urban inequality. Uh, what this means in practice is breaking down the barriers that make it more difficult for people to move into new types of, of neighborhoods. It means doing away with the exclusionary zoning policies uh, that limit who can live in what kind of community. The only way in which you can overcome gross inequality is to concentrate wisely and carefully resources that enable people not only to be lifted from, but to lift themselves from that disadvantage so that you're building what in academia would be called social capital. You're building the capacity of people to be able to get out of a situation for which they were never responsible in the first place. As well as these specific causes of spatial inequality, it's possible that spatial inequality is something that's inherent within a capitalist society. Imagine, for example, a world where we all had exactly the same income, most perfect equality in terms of income. In that world, there would still be some areas that have higher house prices than others. Areas that have the best views, for example, or have the lowest crime, have the lowest pollution. House prices in those areas will tend to be higher. But there's a limit to how much those houses 
can rise in price. And that's because everybody's income is equal. Now imagine that world becoming unequal in terms of the incomes that people have. Those on the highest incomes, they can bid up the prices of housing in the wealthiest areas or in the best areas, the areas with the lowest crime, the best schools, the best employment opportunities. And that means that as those house prices in the best areas rise, people on low incomes get sorted by the market into the areas with the worst crime, the worst schools, the worst employment opportunities, etc. And that means that in order to address spatial inequality, you have to address the overall distribution of income. You have to tackle income inequality as well. Fundamentally, you have to address the fundamental causes of inequality. So that's inequalities in income and wealth. So you need to redistribute income. You need to mitigate against the effects of poverty and not stop there, but actually reduce poverty and eliminate poverty. So all these things are out there. It's not that we don't know what to do. It's that we need political will. And for future governments, we need political bravery to stand up to vested in in interests and redistribute income and do the policies that we know would work to narrow inequalities. I think the key thing would be to have a balance of both spatial policies and individual policies. That is to say, spatial policies have to work hand in glove with individual policies to, to promote well-being and, and equality. So at the individual level, I think that wealth taxes and higher marginal rate income taxes at the upper end would be absolutely crucial. Those funds raised through that kind of more progressive wealth and income taxation system could be used in a variety of ways. You'd have a system where hopefully uh, you'd have a fair distribution of income and wealth and the means of getting that in a more fair way would be to take some of that higher end wealth and income and redistribute it to jurisdictions which would disproportionately help lower income, concentrations of disadvantage, and provide a foundation for those communities to help become a springboard for their population to succeed, as opposed to now, a pit where they can ba barely escape from. So spatial inequality really is a problem that society needs to address. It creates a postcode lottery in employment and educational opportunities, in health and life expectancy, and it reinforces these inequalities down generations. We know that part of the solution is to reduce overall income inequality. But there are also specific things that we need to do to support and regenerate the most deprived areas. But how do we make this happen? We need to find practical ways of monitoring the multiple dimensions of inequality. Spatial inequalities, not just in income, but also in education, employment, pollution and exposure to crime. And it's this need for practical measures that's at the core of our Understanding Inequalities project and that spurred our development of new methods for monitoring multidimensional spatial inequality. These new measures will help us design new policies and hold government to account. Our goal is to catalyse a new vision for area-based policies in the 21st century. One thing's for certain, spatial inequality is not going away unless as a society we decide to do something about it.